quite possible this could be the best service we've ever had. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Stewart. I appreciate that. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 43, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. In Isaiah 43, verse 2. Thank you. No, you're good. Isaiah chapter 43 and in verse 2. And if you're there and you're able, would you stand with me in reverence to God's word? In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2, the Bible says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame, the flame kindle upon thee. My message this afternoon is entitled, Using Your Pain for God's Purpose. Using Your Pain for God's Purpose. Let's pray. Father, we thank You and praise You, Lord, for Your goodness and Your grace through those times of pain. Lord, we all go through them. We understand that this life is full of pain, not because of anything You've done, but God, because sin entered in the world. And I pray, Father, that You would help us, God, to have the right response. Lord, I pray that even, Lord, as our church has gone through many that have, Lord, this year we've seen so many people saved, but at the same time we've also seen a lot of people hurting, a lot of people go through that pain. I pray, Father, that you would help us, God, as a church to deal with it right and as individuals that it would, it would perform your work in us. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. There's a song called The Refiner's Fire, and the words go like this. It says, There burns a fire of sacred heat, white hot with holy flame, and those who dare pass through its blaze will not emerge the same. Some as bronze and some as silver, some as gold and with great skill, all are hammered by their suffering on the anvil of his will. The refiner's fire has now become my soul's desire, purged and cleansed and purified, that the Lord may be glorified. Listen, it's just a fact of life. No matter what you do, no matter where you go, no matter how long you live or how short you live, you are going to endure some pain in your life. You're going to go through some hard times. You're going to have to endure disappointments, tragedies, catastrophe. It's going to happen. The question is, what are you going to do with it? The song, The Refiner's Fire, is a great thought. And our trials, our suffering, they need to make us better than we were before. But the unfortunate truth is that far too many allow their pain to make them bitter instead of better. Your pain has a purpose in God's master plan. There's a reason for it. I heard a preacher once say, pain is like a puzzle. You look on the outside of the box and maybe it's a beautiful portrait, a peaceful meadow. But when you take a single puzzle piece... It really doesn't look attractive. It's an odd shape, and it doesn't look like it belongs anywhere. That's how your pain is. We often don't understand why, and when we go through pain in life, it seems out of place and certainly nothing attractive or desirable about it. But when God completes His purpose in it, you'll notice that things do start fitting together. Even in some of the most severe catastrophes and some of the most severe problems, someone may say, well, I've lost a loved one or I'm going through cancer, I'm facing divorce. We won't understand those puzzle pieces in our life. Uh, when God allows 
them to start fitting together, pretty soon a picture emerges. And I'm not going to lie to you because sometimes the puzzle pieces that we put together becomes unattractive. I've seen people that have gone through tragedy and gone through trials and gone through tribulations and gone through infirmities. And I used to, when I'd come to church, I used to kind of marvel at that. I used to, wow, you know, it's amazing what you've gone through. And, uh, and, and how you've endured it. And I, I've had to learn that sometimes people don't go through things. They, they don't become better for it. I, I've watched people go through hard things and they become hard. They become, become angry. They become bitter. And often they become friendless because they haven't been able to handle their tragedy. True bravery and courage comes when you and I, because everybody goes through pain, everybody has to go through trials and tribulations, the people that really are the, I guess, the, the heroes, if you will, of that pain are the ones not just that have been through it, but the ones that come out the other side with a smile, with a heart full of joy, with a positive attitude. And that is going to depend on what you do. No one learns to swim without water. And that takes us to our text. God says, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow me, overflow thee. There's no promise that you wouldn't get wet or, or that we wouldn't swim in the deep. And the promise that we see in this portion of Scripture really is twofold. What are you going to do with it? God gives us a promise, one that he's going to be there. He's going to be there. There's no loneliness for the Christian that loves the Lord, that's serving the Lord. God will be with you. You have that promise from the scriptures. I, I love being around. I remember one of the first times I went and visited uh, Miss Teresa when she went in the hospital that first time. And uh, me and uh, I met uh, uh, Mrs. Yant went and, and, and I believe that Hannah was there and I think Lydia was there and uh, I, I, I had got there, and then they'd shown up, or I can't remember if they got there, and I showed up. And, but I brought a guitar with me with the idea that I'm going to cheer Mrs. Glass up. And, uh, and, and we started playing, and, and I can't remember. I think we played. I don't, I don't know who holds. I know who holds tomorrow. I think we played that song, and she started crying, and, and Mrs. Yant started hugging on her. And... and um, and I'm, I'm sitting there going through the song, and I'm thinking, hold it together. You're a man. And so I did, and, and we finished our song, and we just kept singing songs, and she was singing with us. And I remember, like, toward the end of that, you know, Teresa kind of looked at us, and we were talking about, you know, she was really going through it at that time. And, I mean, she's still going through it. But I remember toward the end of that visit, I was, I was impressed because she was in pain with her faith. She, she was like, I, I, I believe, I have faith. I, I have faith in God. He's going to take care of this. And at the time, too, you know, it was whether he takes me home or whether or not. And I was like, listen, you ain't going anywhere. And Miss Teresa, I know you're listening to this message because you listen to all of our messages. You're going to be sitting in these front seats again. And that's what we all believe to happen. But she always just, regardless of which way it goes, she's just one of those people that stays positive, doesn't feel sorry for herself. She, she stays positive. And I know that there are times where she doesn't feel good and she shed tears and all of those things. But when you look at people like that, it's a testimony. Because at some point in time, all of us are going to face that. 
you're living out this life, and at the end of this life, there's a tragedy called death. None of us know how we're going to, what it's going to be for us, whether it's going to be cancer, whether it's going to be a car accident, whether it's going to be a, 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 a work accident, whether you're going to go down in a sub trying to explore the Titanic. Who knows? You know, that was an instant. Those people didn't even know. Uh, and, and, and I was reading reports on how that would have happened. It would have been just like instantaneous. That's like how I want to go. I, I don't want it to be this thing that drags out. Everybody says, I just want to go in my sleep, you know? Um, but that's generally not how it happens. We get old and things happen. Things start breaking down. The question is, how are you going to handle it? But there's a promise you have as a Christian. Hey, you're going to get wet. The waters are going to come over you, but God says, I ain't leaving you. I'm not leaving your side. So that's a promise you and I have. In, in, in Joshua chapter 1, verse 5, the Bible says, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Uh, Joshua is about to step into the shoes of the biggest leader Israel ever had or ever would have. David would become Israel's greatest king. Moses was Israel's greatest leader. And Joshua was about to step into his shoes. Could you imagine just for a minute the trepidation, the intimidation he would have in stepping in that job and yet, he's got God telling him, just like I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. You know, it doesn't matter who you are. If you are saved, you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you're walking with God, you've given your life to Him, God is going to be with you just like He'd be with Moses. We, we often don't realize the, that, you know, we look at all these other people, well, certainly God has a much higher regard for the Apostle Paul, or God has a much higher regard for somebody like Moses, or for the disciples, or some of these great patriarchs of the Bible. But I love how Hebrews chapter 11 goes through this hall of faith. It goes through all of these great people, and then it opens up in chapter 12 saying, telling us, therefore, or wherefore, it's wherefore. And then it tells us that we need to run the race, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Listen, if you're here and you're saved, you understand that, and even if you're not saved here today, that can change and needs to change. But the same price that was paid for Moses, for Peter, for Paul, is the same price that God paid for you. There's no diminishing it. And so God promises, hey, I'm going to be with you. That's, that's a promise. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, at the end of that verse, he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Isaiah 54, 10, for the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, uh, saith the Lord that hath mercy. Now I understand he's talking about he's talking about Israel, he's talking about the congregation, but these these promises are certainly applicable for us because of what we have in the New Testament, the promises that God gives us with him, being that mediator. You don't have to go through anything alone. But he also says, he also shows them this. In our text, he says, When thou passest through the water, I will be with thee. And through the, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. There are going to be times in this life where I've even heard people say, one thing after another, they, something happens, and then something else happens, and something else happens. And you're just like, God, I'm drowned in here. God says, no, you're not. I said I wouldn't let you. You think you're drowning. You're being waterboarded a little bit. But you're not drowning. 
And, and, you know, it's funny, the perspective that we get, because we will go through these problems, and, oh, the car broke down, and, 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 and the air conditioner went out, and, and, and we've got these repairs we need to do on the house, and, and we'll just be like, dollar signs, ching, 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 ching. We're like, I just can't keep up. Why is God letting this happen? On the other side of the world... There's some Christian that's there that hoping that he can just get clean water. He's serving the Lord and is happy that he's got one change of clothes. Remember, me and Pastor Dunlop were talking one time, and uh, one of his kids went down to, uh, I, they were going to work a camp, and it was like in like Venezuela or some place like that, and and all these kids were going to go out, and they were doing a camp. Well, he expected a camp like you get in America. You know, you go, and there's cabins, and there's all these different things. And, and, and you know, and he was told, hey, this is very rustic. You know, um, just make sure you don't bring too much. Just bring a, a, a bag. And, and, and he says that he went into, he goes in, he's staying with the boys in their area. He gets his mat. He rolls it out. And he puts his bag there only to realize none of them have any clothes. They're wearing all week what's on their back. They don't have anything to change into. Half of them don't have shoes. And we start going through, the car broke down. And we can't afford to get it fixed and our life is falling apart. The air conditioning went out. And man, in the Pacific Northwest, you've got to have air conditioning. Meanwhile, in their jungles, it's 90 degrees and 100% humidity or whatever crazy thing it is. And, 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 and they got boils and they got all these, all these problems. And you and I are going through our situation and we're, we're drowning. God's like, you're not drowning. I've got you. I'm there with you. Our children often want to learn to swim, but... That fear of jumping in the water can be overwhelming. When they finally jump in, what do we do? Do we catch them and keep them out of the water? No, we let the, we let the resistance of the water slow them down. They go under, and what do we do? We pick them up and we pull them out. But they'll never experience what it's like to swim, what it's like to jump off a dock into, into the water if they, never, if they never have the, the, the courage to jump in, and sometimes for us to let that water stop their fall a little bit, we pull them up as they gasp for air. But the more you swim in the deep end, the better your swimming ability becomes. The pain that you go through in your life is, is not there to destroy you. It's there to strengthen you. It's there to develop you. Do you get better or do you get bitter? How do you handle it? I remember me and my brother Chris, when we were in high school, I used to go to high school and sometimes he would, he would have me, he worked at Boeing, so their parking lot was, uh, so he would have me tow his boat to school. So I'd go to school and I'd tow the boat. We'd have all the stuff in it because I actually, my school was closer to the lake, and so we, I would take the boat, and then I would meet him up at the lake, and, and, and he would be like, well, we need a flagger. So I used to get my friends, and I had a lot of friends in high school, and I'd take a boat to school. All my friends would be like, you guys going water skiing today? Right after school, do you need a flagger? Yeah, I need a flagger. And so... Because you have to have somebody that holds the flag up in the boat and the whole thing. So I would bring my friends. We'd head up and we'd all go up to the lake. And I had this one friend. His name was Paul. And I really liked Paul. He was the center on our basketball team. He was this tall, skinny kid. And, uh, and, and, but he was like, he was afraid of his own shadow. Our coach was constantly on him. And he would tell, he would tell the two forwards, it was me and at one time it was we had a guy named Aaron that was a forward, and then later on that switch. But he would tell me and Aaron, he'd like, you guys need to body up on him. 
put a body on him. He needs to get aggressive. And so he's this tall, skinny kid, and we'd push against him and, and, and trying to toughen him up and get him going and the whole thing. And he just, he was shy and, and withheld. Well, he had a bad experience with water, so he never wanted to go with us. Well, he saw like a lot of our friends were starting to go on the boat. And so he asked me one day, he goes, hey, can I go? And I'm like, yeah, you absolutely can go. Let, let's go, you know. So we get up to the lake, and, and everybody's been tubing. I'm like, Paul, you going to go tubing? Yeah, I'll go after so-and-so. Yeah, I'll go later. And, and finally, everyone's in the boat, and they're like, come on, Paul, let's go. Sometimes peer pressure is a bad thing. Sometimes it can be a good thing, though, too. God, come on, Paul, get in the water. And, and he would get all excited, and then when it was his time to jump into the water, there would just be something. I'm like, dude, you got a life jacket. Nothing's going to happen to you. It's like, yeah, but I've seen how you guys drive the boat. Dude, we'll take it easy. I promise. We'll take it easy. And you know, it was just that he'd just get to the edge of the boat, and then he'd just withdraw, and he would stop. Listen, you need your pain. You understand that today? If you and I don't have some pain in our life, there is no proof of our faith. There's no resistance to it. We got to... if. If tithing was easy, where's the sacrifice? There's got to be some pain. There's got to be some, some resistance. That's what makes us strong. What are you doing with your pain? I know sometimes, sometimes the pain seems overwhelming. You look at it and you go, you know, I just, I can't, I can't handle this. I remember a couple of times just going through some hard times in our own family and talking to my wife and and she would I there were there have been a couple of times Carrie told me she goes when we were in the middle of of some things Carrie goes I thought God promised he wouldn't give us what we couldn't handle I thought God promised he and I remember she came to this conclusion once. She said, God never promised he wouldn't give you what you couldn't handle. He promised he would never give you what he couldn't handle. And it changed her whole perspective. And, and I noticed once she kind of came to that conclusion, it was like, it doesn't matter. You know, because for a long time she'd go, well, I guess God really thinks I can go through a lot. No, God knows you're a pathetic weakling. That's what we, the conclusion we came to. But God won't put you through anything that he can't handle. He knows what, he knows you need that pain. All of us go through pain. It's inevitable with life. Your pain will change you one way or the other. You can come out of it with bitterness. You can come out of it with a chip on your shoulder. You can let it harden you, or you can see the goodness of God in it. You can trust him to put the rest of the puzzle pieces together and come out of it with a new passion for the Lord, a better resolve, and a renewed confidence in him. But it doesn't matter. Everybody goes through pain. Everybody goes through pain. There's a quote that goes like this, pain is seldom a choice, but how you come out of it is you can either just go through it or you can grow through it. And I know, unfortunately, I know a lot of people who have gone through horrible things in their life, tragic things in their life. Very few grow through it. Way too many people just go through it. They get depressed. They get down. They live their life in anger, discouragement, bitterness. They blame everyone. They, they're, they're upset. They become suicidal. They become all those are all those are all proofs that you did not grow through it. 
God knows what you need when you need it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, the Bible says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will glory in, mine, in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Can you imagine saying that? I can't imagine saying that. I don't take pleasure in infirmities. I understand pain is a natural part of life, but there are a few people that, you know, they're like, embrace the suck. Have you ever heard that term? I think it's an army term. It's like that's, you're crawling in the mud, you're freezing cold, you're going through some obstacle course, you look miserable because you are miserable, and they tell you to love it. Don't you love it? Isn't this awesome? And that's kind of the idea. And you know, there comes a point in time where you're like, this is cool. This is good. It's good for me. You ever see, you ever see a bunch of people that are out and they're working in the rain and they're working in the mud and they're out there and they're working in it? It was like last year, me and my nephew were doing this job and it was the, these people's basement was flooding. And, and they actually presented my nephew with the job and he, he, he was going to decline it. I'm like, dude, we could do that. We can do that. I think I know how to do that. And he's like, Are you, seriously, you want to try? I'm like, yeah, I think we can do that. So we, we go up there and this was when it was just, this was last year when it was just downpouring. We had those, those weeks of, of just pouring rain. I know what you're thinking. You're like, that's like every winter. What are you talking about? That's like Pacific Northwest. But this was really bad. Things were flooding, and it was just, it was downpouring. These people's basement was flooding. Him and I are out there, and we're digging in this mud. And at first, you know, it's miserable. But I remember looking at him, and I go, dude, we're in rain slicks and stuff, and we're just covered in head to toe to mud. I still have pictures of it. I'm like, dude, isn't this awesome? And then pretty soon he's like, it is awesome. And we were just like digging in the mud and just slopping this mud. And you just get ultra focused on it. And, and, and like you start working in it. You ever see like it's raining and you, your mind looks out there and goes, man, that's cold. But then there's those people that go, dude, wouldn't it be awesome to go play football on that muddy pit? And you see these kids, and they go out, and they're playing football in this mud and this muck. And you're just like, yeah, that's awesome. Listen, it's all in how you're going to embrace those things. How, how, how are you going to go through it? Knowing that it's going to strengthen you. Knowing that... Some of your best memories are going to be when you go through pain. I want you to think about this. We have a service in the not too far future. Don and Teresa are up here in the front. Daniel and Shelby are back. Sally Peters is back. And maybe even Charity is here at that point in time. This is the sad thing, though, is that oftentimes when we go through those situations as life hits us, we don't even appreciate that like we should when it happens. And we quickly go past it without even considering it. Have you, have you thought about that? Do, do we think about, do we embrace those moments? That, that time, do you, you realize we're sitting in a building that we've been sitting in now for 11 years? This building 15 years ago, 20 years ago, was a dream. Sherry, me and Sherry were talking about this a while ago. And Sherry told me, she goes, I remember some of the old people that just had been in the old building for the last several decades. When we started planning that building, they told her, well, well, we won't be alive to see it. They were all alive to see it. 
Many of them, we did their funerals in this building. And, and, and you know, and now we sit in this building, we don't even give it much thought. Why? Because we've moved on to the next flood. We've moved on to the next fire. Listen, embrace the pain. Because you're going to see things in God that you never thought you'd see. And that's one of the problems. We just don't learn from it. We get bitter and we move on to the next thing. God knows you need it. You need pain. You need it in your life. What does the Apostle Paul say about his infirmities? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. The power of Christ, does it rest upon us? Because when it does, it usually means that you're resting in Christ. Paul points out the only way to be strong was for him to be weak. He realized that he needed infirmities, that the power of Christ would rest on him. Paul became strong because of that. He also found joy in it. He didn't dread the infirmities. The Bible says he gloried in them. Great men of faith Always find strength and weakness at the worst times. Hebrews 11.33, the Bible says about these great men toward the end of the chapter, it says, it says, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and you say, Pastor, these got to be mighty men. The Bible says, out of weakness, we're made strong. Out of weakness. The Bible continues on. Waxed valiant in fight, turns to flight the armies of the aliens. For about 21 days, an egg stops a baby chick from entering into the world. But who do you and I look at as the winner of that contest? For 21 days, that hard shell helps develop that small bird. And even as the chick struggles to break through that shell, it's preparing it for life. Your trials may seem to stop you for a while, and at times, they seem overwhelming. But the weakness of those moments, God's developing you into something. Something better than you are today. A better version. Just like he gives that baby chicken exactly what he needs at that moment. He's giving and allowing you and I to go through exactly what you need to, to promote you, to make you better. Without the pain, you and I can never reach the fullness of God's purpose in this life. There is a purpose for the pain every time. If God allowed it, he has a purpose for it. Don't just go through it. Grow through it. But you also need to learn the lessons of it. you got to learn the lessons. Sometimes we endure pain because of our own bad decisions, be it bad Bad relationships, financial debt, saying things we wish we could take back. On and on we could go. But God's good because he uses those to strengthen us too. All the Bible, the Bible shows us all things still work together for good to them that love God. Romans 8.28 is still true. But you got to learn the lesson. You got to learn the lesson. So you're not going through the same pain over and over and over again. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, the Bible says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are before, behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. We know that Paul shows us to forget the past. The idea is putting it behind us, pressing forward. Paul forgot the past but he shows us that he remembered the lessons. Galatians chapter 1, verse 13, he says, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my, my equals in mine own nation, being more exceeding zealous of the traditions of my fathers. 
But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Paul didn't, he, he didn't forget where he came from, but he, he stopped living in it. He answered the call. He went forward. He became better. I heard a pastor one time who had just preached in a fellow, on the fellowship in the church say that a woman in the church he had preached at told him, you know, pastor, I've been in this church for 50 years. and I've never had anybody that I could really ever say was my best friend. Pastor that was recounting the, tor- the story to me told me, said, I didn't say it at the time, but my mind was screaming. There's one common denominator in that. Learn the lessons of pain. We often want to blame our pain on other people. That's not growing through it. That's wasting it. You've wasted your pain. Especially when pain is self-inflicted. When you and I make those dumb decisions that we all make, we all do it, we're all guilty of it. Learn the lesson. Learn the lesson. Are you bringing pain on yourself? I heard a story about a man that got hit by a car and gets out of his car and says, Lady, you need to learn how to drive. You're the fourth car that I've been in an accident with today. Are you bringing pain on yourself? Is your marriage suffering because you say everything that comes to mind? You ever met the person that says, Why well, just speak my mind? Uh, Proverbs says, discretion shall preserve thee. Do people walk on eggshells around you because they never know what you're going to do or how you're going to react? Do you have to keep your emotions in check? Do you fly off the handle or blame people for pain that you endure? Learn the lessons of pain or you're just going to keep going through it. And, and, And you need to understand the forces that are against you gone through a lot in this church this year. Man, we've got our share of blessings as well. We've had more people saved in the first six months of this year than we've had in any other year that at least I've been the pastor here. We have seen a lot of people come to know Christ as their Savior. And uh, and it's not that we had, last year was one of our best years, but this year is, we're halfway through the year and we just, I think with the last salvation, we just passed um, our total for last year, in six months of this year. On visitation, I think we actually had a run on visitation where we had somebody in five, five weeks in a row, we had someone get saved. Many of them have come, visited the church of Ben here. This church is full of people that have been saved, come to know the Lord in the last five years. And I, 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 every time I look back and I see, I see Harlan or back there, I think of that guy in the tent. It was like I came to this church. I was, when I came, I, Peter talked to him, and he was, we, we prayed for him in our men's prayer meeting. And Peter said, I think he's an atheist. So I don't know what's going to happen. He ain't an atheist anymore. Yeah. And he's been married, and he's got kids, and they've been coming to the church, and he's been coming to the church now for years. Uh, uh, we've got all kinds of examples in our church of people that have been saved, and we've seen over the years just people, people that, that it was hard for them to, they kept coming, kept coming. Jeff was like going to be the death of me. Finally, when I'm like at my wit's end in my office, are you saved? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Finally, we got to the point where I had to re- learn some lessons. You don't save people. God does it. And, uh, and, and I remember going through the verses, going through the verses. That verse in James kept going in my head. 
The engrafted word is able to save your souls. And I asked him, I said this, Brother Walzak, according to the Bible, are you saved? He said, well, according to the Bible, I'm saved. I'm like, I'll take it. <laughs> and you know, the proof honestly wasn't even that day, because I'll be honest with you, I went home, and I was like, going back over my head, the conversation going, did he get saved? Did he? I don't know, you know. But after time, he started to come into church. That great change that God does happen in his life. And, now, and, and he's been one of the respected men in this church for years now as a result. Some of the most amped up, excited people that we have in our church have been saved in the last five, six years. Do we forget that? There was pain that went with some of that. There was unsurety. There was resistance. But when people like Shady get saved and then you see how it changes them and all of a sudden they're telling you about a past and people are going, no way. No way. Like, no. There's been a great change. And, and, and all of a sudden we, we get to see what that can do, what God will do. Understand there are forces against us. Job teaches us that. I'm not going to go through Job. You guys know, um, you know the story. He didn't know what was against him. He had no clue. And we even see, if you read that book, you even see some of his unsurety. You see the friends that didn't back him. Lots of messages in that portion of Scripture. But the main, the main message of Job, I think, is the fact that you and I do not know what's going on. And we're going through our pain. Job had no clue what was going on. He had no clue the forces that he was up against. The pain Job endured was brought on by forces outside of his control. And, and listen, you and I have the same forces in our life. As people are getting saved, I think that's why we're going through a lot of the things we've seen this year. Having a year where we've seen more people saved, ironically with Teresa, the first people that were saved were her grandkids. And when we've talked about that, she told me, she told me, she goes, I would take cancer for that. Listen, what are we doing with our pain? What are we doing with our pain? There are forces against you. You and I need to be prepared. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. The Bible says this, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down. Someday those outside forces are going to be gone. God's going to take care of all of it. But right now it strengthens us. We've been given tools. God doesn't equip us with weapons for no reason. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15, God's given you armor because there's a very real foe. In verse 16, the Bible says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. In our text, God not only promises to keep us from drowning, but he also promises to keep us from burning up. Isaiah chapter 50, uh, 43, verse, verse 2, the Bible says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Hey, it'll get hot, but you're not going to get burned. You're not going to get burned. He says, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. You're not going to get burned, and you're not going to die. Satan may bring the fire, but your faith says, that God controls the thermostat. He will not take me through what he cannot protect me from. We know that he'll give us things we don't think we can handle, but we can. Without Job's trial, what would the message in Job be? Without the great size of Goliath, what would be the point of David and Goliath? No, it's, it's the, the, the obstacle that makes the story great. God knows how to take your mess and turn it into a message. 
The reason God allows you to go through it is so you can help other people. We have people that are hurting. What's the reason I went through my trials? So I can help them. So I can be there for them. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 4, the Bible says, Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. If you and I take on the victim mentality, we will bring others down instead of lifting them up. Maybe it's time to stop questioning God. And instead of asking why, start asked answering how. How? See the puzzle piece that God is putting together in your life to paint this picture, this plan, this purpose. It'll give you a new perspective. For the Christian this morning or this afternoon, you're going through the floods, the fire. You have got your pain. Maybe even you're going through the floods and the fire right now. Right now, right right now in church. Don't get caught up in understanding where this puzzle piece fits in. Just move forward. The key is to get your eyes off yourself. Stop focusing on your problems. Healing comes when you and I stop focusing on what we lost, what didn't work, what didn't, didn't happen, because there's a blessing in that pain that we can use for other people. Have you considered some of the best ministries we have came from someone's pain? The Apostle Paul, I already read that portion of Scripture, said that his weakness is made strong in God. God wouldn't remove his infirmity of his eyes. Why? Because a weak Paul was better than a strong one. Weakness has been one of the great ministries. You know, as you and I look back at this cross, do you understand that cross is in the scepter of a king? It's a lamb that was crucified. Jesus didn't come in strength to impress you and I. He came in weakness to die for you and I. There's a lady name of Johnny Erickson Tata. Many of you may have heard of her. She has written dozens of books, has a radio show. She started an organization to help disabled people. Joni was extremely active, but in 1967, she was swimming in Chesapeake Bay with some friends. She misjudged the depth of water. They were jumping in. And she dove in headfirst and she broke her neck. She instantly became a quadriplegic. She learned to write by holding a pencil in her mouth. She later started painting something she had never really done before. She was very physically active, so she didn't really do a lot of sit-down stuff. But now that changed. Today, if you Google her name, the first thing that comes up is all of her artwork. It's beautiful. She sells artwork anywhere from $20 to $600 to thousands of dollars. And she's become a multimillionaire as a result. She claims it grew her relationship with God abundantly through her tragedy. I, my wife read her book. It's an older book um, that she wrote back in the 70s, just kind of her autobiography. And it was very impressive what God can do with somebody who's going through those types of things. Although there are obvious doctrinal differences between us, her impact in the lives of many people and any, even many Christians is undeniable. You and I never know what God's going to accomplish. But make no mistake about it. If you let him, he's going to accomplish something. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, the Bible says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Isaiah 53, 3, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. 
He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. In his pain, Christ bore your sins on his cross. What I wonder today is, will you allow your pain to do the same in someone else's life? Instead of looking at our situations and our problems, are we willing to help somebody else? Because we live in, we're in a church right here in Longview. Whether we know it or not, or whether we remember it or not, is full of miracle after miracle after miracle. Pastor Stewart, when he first came to this church, used to, now it's intentionality. He gets on these words and he'll stay on them for a while. But when he first came to our church, he used to preach messages and he used to ask this question all the time. It was very thought provoking. He'd say, What is your why? What is your why? Why are you here? And the question to that is answered very easily in the Word of God. We're here to serve God, to worship Him, but we're here to serve each other. And we can't do that when we're at odds against each other. We can't do that when... We're struggling with all these other things. We can't do that when we're focused on ourselves. God has a reason for your pain. The question is, what are you going to do with it? Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. With every head bowed and every eye closed, are you going to grow better? Are you going to grow bitter? Are you going to be what God would have you to be? Because the truth is, there are people that need you. There are people that need you. And I don't know what the puzzle piece is in your life. I don't know how it's going to fit together. I don't know how things are going to happen. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what God's going to do with some of the tragedies that have unfolded. And and just from from a human perspective, from, from a dad, a father, and from somebody who in some cases has been very active, It seems very unfair, some of the circumstances. We often ask, well, why did did this happen to this person? They're so young. Why did this happen to this person? Because they got such a sweet spirit. I don't know. And we, we probably will never know this side of eternity. But one thing I do know is this. I know this. All things work together for good to them that love God them that are called according to his purpose. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, is just as true today as it was when it was written. Christian, what are you doing with your pain? What are you doing with... Maybe today it's a message on just don't get focused on yourself. We can get so focused on driving the right car, having the house on the hill, having the right stuff, having the right ability, looking a certain way that we forget really what's important in this life. Father, we pray that you just impress on us, Lord, each one of us in this room has something we need to improve, something we need to work on, something we need to learn. And Lord, I would guess that far more than 50% of this church is going through some pain, some situation. God, help us to learn through it. Help us to grow through it. Help us to be what we're supposed to be. And Lord, for all of us, that we would learn to be a help to others in it. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Thank you, Lord, that you used your pain to save us. May we use ours to help others. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. Turn to hymn number 160. Turn your eyes upon Jesus as we sing.
God, great services today, amen. Amen. I appreciate Pastor Yant teaching the kids to lead people to the Lord. And our teen class did a fabulous job. It was a blessing. Of course, Pastor Stewart's message this morning topped off a very good message. Listen, we ought to leave encouraged. But more, more than that, we ought to leave encouraging other people. I'd encourage you today. Maybe reach out and just send a text to some of the people that we mentioned or maybe somebody that you noticed wasn't here today. And be an encouragement. Start there. Start there. Tell somebody that you love them. Get involved. Do something for the cause of Christ. Let's get engaged. Let's get involved. Let's do something for the Lord this year. Got six months left, and then the Lord's coming back. Amen. If he did, wouldn't you want to get busy? I don't know that it can make it another six months. I'm looking around. I'm thinking, my goodness. But um, we, we need to live like the Lord's coming back. So, amen. Man, great day. Great day. It is good to have the Alexanders back. Amen. They uh, were down with uh, Sanchez's, and um, they're doing really good. And they all keep telling me how good that church is down there. And um, I keep telling them, okay, you can like it, but you can't love it. Okay? <laughs> this is your church. But it's good having you guys back. Would you close us in a Wonderful messages today, Lord. Just the opportunity to be together with Christian brothers and sisters and feel love. And, and Father, we just uh, we just thank you for all you've done in our kids' lives, Lord. And pray for the folks that are here and charity and all those folks. And Teresa, we just feel that you have done it. Let us be an encouragement to you that Father. Let's get us home safely and back on Wednesday. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for all you do. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Don't forget, teams are doing uh, Ruby Floats. Back in the other room, it's a dollar a cup.